This episode of the Western Outdoor News Podcast is brought to you by Penn. Every bite on the water is just the beginning of a gear-testing battle of man versus fish. In this game, there are no ties. Since 1932, Penn has equipped saltwater anglers worldwide with gear built specifically to deliver an advantage over angry fish that's as reliable as the tide tables. Penn's new Workhorse Battle 3 spinning reel with proprietary CNC gear technology and the proven durability of an HT100 carbon fiber drag system comes in nine sizes to allow anglers to take the battle to the fish wherever they swim. Go to PennFishing.com and let the battle begin. It is a totally different puzzle and challenge, I would say, than the boat. And at this point, it's like... I wouldn't use a boat to go fishing, which is such such a strange thing because you can catch bigger fish off a boat, obviously. Welcome back to the Western Outdoor News Podcast. This week lines up with our March 4th, 2022 issue of Western Outdoor News. Today we have two guests, a quick conversation with Steve Terrigliato from the Turkey Tune-Up this past weekend at Lake Henshaw. It was a really successful event and a lot of turkey action as we're getting close to the turkey season. Plus, we have a fascinating roundtable with Ben Harvey Murray and two brothers who have mastered the art of catching rockfish and game species from the shore. So another shore roundtable, shore fishing roundtable rather, and it's a super interesting conversation. I can't wait for you guys to hear it. But first, in West Coast fishing and hunting news, let's get to the headlines this week. A slew of dam removals look likely to transform the Klamath River and the surrounding waters, which is great news for many migratory fish that have suffered in recent decades. We've got the full story about the dam removals in the latest issue of Western Outdoor News. Pyramid Lake takes the title for this week's Inform Fishery with several giant cutthroats and one that was so incredible it landed on the cover this week. Jumping over to Lake Kahuya, we had a giant 36-pound flathead catfish that was caught on cut bait doused in bite on Cajun scent. The lake has also turned up some monster rainbows lately, including the 10-pounder pictured on page 2. We also have the California Guns and Hunting edition of Western Outdoor News in this week's issue. We've got you covered from the start of March turkey hunting season with features on tactics and suitable shotguns. We also have tips on spot and stock hunts and uh, with some tips about taking kids hunting as well to check out in our Cal Guns and Hunting issue of Western Outdoor News. So the big news in bass fishing this week, it was the capture of two double-digit largemouths during a major league fishing event, a feat that broke the tournament record twice in two days. It's pretty incredible. The same angler, Daiwa Pro Randy Howell, caught both fish, and we've got the full story on page 7. And speaking of competitive bass angling, the Juan Bass Circuit makes its way to the Laughlin Open at Lake Mojave, March 23rd through 25th. It's not too late to sign up, especially if you've got a boat. We've got pro spots open. Head over to wonews.com to sign up for the Juan Bass Laughlin Open, March 23rd through 25th. Saltwater fans will be interested to read tips on fishing for bass around structure and rockfish tactics ahead of the rockfish opener this week. Plus, we're running through everything you need to know about tipping on sport boats on page 32. You might have a buddy that you could send that to. Tipping tips on sport boats, page 32. Send that to some friends. I'm sure you've got a couple guys who could use it. For more on these stories, plus all the usual fish counts, tips, features, private boat reports, and more, check out the latest issue of Western Outdoor News. So first, let's hear from Steve Terrigliato about that spring turkey tune-up and a little preview of what's to come during the turkey season this year. Well, I don't know what the final numbers were, but we had a really, really good crowd, that's for sure, and, and we had a lot of great vendors and and professional callers and things so i think we're we're going in the right direction as far as a an event here in southern california that addresses you know hunting and and fishing for that matter here in southern california Mm -hmm. tell me who made this this whole event possible well nwtf first and foremost national wild turkey federation uh had the region director here and and uh, uh all the volunteers that are part of our san diego chapter um we're all here, obviously, and, and uh, 
it, it's a it's a team effort. I mean, there's no getting around it. There's a lot of folks involved, and and uh, Janice Mindenhall, who actually leases all of that, um, lets us and allows us to have this event on her property. Absolutely. Tell me about the upcoming season. What are you most excited about? Uh, we we apparently had it looks apparently that we had another good hatch. It appears. Uh, geez, I've repeated that three times. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we, we uh, went out this morning. It was 22 degrees, so the turkeys are kind of like humans. They weren't really active, but they were flying down early. And uh, we saw a number of uh, gobblers with uh, broke-up hens, so they are dispersing right now. Uh, right here where we have some of the hunts, it uh, there were a couple long beards with 40 hens, and then just down the way there was a single gobbler with 12 hens. And so dispersal has started, and... Uh, we're excited about the season. A lot of people are shocked to hear that Southern California is such a good uh, uh, an area for hunting, but what would you say to those people? Well, it's it's a phenomenon that started in 1993 that, you know, 293 turkeys were brought into San Diego County, and, and they just, if you said, God, make me some turkey habitat, this would be it. it you know, oak trees and rolling hills and a lot of grasslands and, and different things, and it, it just was perfect for our turkeys. Uh, John Massey was instrumental on all of this, and and uh, birds were trapped in Kansas and a couple of locations here in San Diego, and they took hold. And you know, I, I don't know if we're at ten or twenty thousand anymore, but we're still solid. And unfortunately, we're the only county in all of San, in Southern California that has turkey, so we're the only game in town. And I mean, if we were like no cal, where there were so many turkeys, we, we could really play ball. So we hope to see everybody next year at the Spring Turkey Tune-Up at Lake Henshaw. Look for it in uh, in late February. Steve said they've got some big plans for next year as well. So on to our main guest this week. We've got two twin brothers that recently wrote a book called California Surf Fishing, The Hunt for Big Fish. They've had a lot of success targeting rockfish and other game fish from shore. That's right. No boat required show up on shore and catch yourself some rockfish? Who would have thought? So Gary and Casper Kazazian, they wrote this book and they have tons of insight. I'm just going to let them take it away. Let's hear straight from Gary and Casper with special guests Ben Harvey Murray and Mike Stevens. So uh, my name is Gary Kazazian. Um, I've been surf fishing in California for about half a decade now or so, I would say. Started fishing from a young age with uh, my uncle in the Mediterranean. Um, both my brother and I... Uh, but it wasn't surf fishing. It wasn't surf fishing in the Mediterranean. It was on a boat. So both my brother and I uh, have mechanical engineering backgrounds. And for the last two years, we've been fishing the surf very regularly, trying to figure out ways to catch big fish, calico bass, sheephead, white sea bass, and halibut. And uh, yeah, this book came together uh, very recently. We, we had some ideas that we thought were pretty interesting and I thought people could really benefit from. So, so I'm Casper uh, Kazazian. Uh, my background is, is pretty similar to Gary's. Uh, started fishing in the Mediterranean. With, our uncle's actually a fisherman in Lebanon. We're actually twin brothers. Yeah, we're twin brothers. I should mention that. Yeah. <laughs> Same oh, wow. Me. That makes sense, seeing some of the photos in the book. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm just a little heftier. A little heftier <laughs> than my brother. Which is good for the you know slinging the heavy sinkers. Anyway, <laughs> back to the back to the the, the intro. Uh, yeah, so for been uh, been surf fishing here in Southern California for about five years. Pretty hard at one point. Still pretty hard. Like probably about for me, like twice a week. Uh, for Gary, maybe three times a week, something like that. But at one point, it was four or five times a week. Uh, surf fishing and just fell in love with it. Rekindled that uh, fishing passion from childhood and yeah, just optimizing techniques. And Gary Gary decided to write a book on the stuff that we've learned. So mm -hmm. uh, here we are. Thank you for having so, us, by the way. Hey, no problem at all. You know, we're also joined here by uh, Western Outdoor News editor Mike Stevens and editor uh, Ben Harvey Murray. And they, they're pretty well versed with surf fishing. Uh, and I just I wanted to start the conversation a little bit off topic. Something I always wonder about surf fishermen, is it a is it a necessity to be a surf fisherman for you, or is it a product of simply not having a boat? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. Uh, sure, go for it, Casper. 
at this point in my life, surf fishing is a necessity. <laughs> um, <laughs> if I had a boat, if I had a boat, I would probably go uh, every once in a while. But like I know Gary and I, we enjoy surf fishing so much that we ha- we haven't really considered it. If I had a boat, I wouldn't even. I wouldn't even. You wouldn't even go. No, there's like for me, surf fishing is incredibly therapeutic. It's the immersion with nature. You're walking for miles, sometimes miles on the beach, sometimes you're not walking all that much. But it, it is it is a totally different puzzle and challenge, I would say, than the boat. And at this point, it's like it just it's just so natural to us and so enjoyable. I would I wouldn't use a boat to go fishing, which is such such a strange thing because you can catch bigger fish off a boat, obviously. Yeah, mm-hmm. but maybe when we're like I don't know in our sixties or something, and like we we can't do the walks and walk on the rocks and you know do do the long walks to the remote spots. Maybe maybe we'll be boat fishermen, more likely pier fishermen. But you never know. <laughs> Got it. How about you, Ben? Are we, would you be a surf fisherman? Is it is it out of just the fact that you don't have a boat, or would it be? Would you be passionate about surf fishing, regardless? Um, well, for me, actually, it's something I've done most of my life, um, regardless of boat ownership or not. <laughs> and um, you know, I went to university, living by the sea, and from then on, really, that kind of ocean fishing, kind of saltwater, land-based saltwater fishing, for me, is, is something that's incredibly challenging, um, incredibly rewarding, also. But um, also, if you gave me a beautiful 25-foot boat, I can't say for certain that I would also be on the sand sort of two, three times a week. I might be zipping off to Catalina and so on. So a bit of both, maybe. I think I'd, I, even if I had the most amazing array of boats, I'd still find a lot of satisfaction in um, catching and targeting fish from the surf. Mm-hmm. But um, definitely catching larger fish from the surf is something I'm really interested in. So I'm really looking forward to this, uh, to this chat today. So yeah. I think that some of those species, like the giant white sea bass, um, you know, things like that are, are pr- pretty, you know, pretty mysterious to some of us, particularly if you're like me, if you're, if you're coming over here as, a, as an immigrant, not really uh, having grown up here. So, you know, things like that are really interesting. So, yeah. And, and I just want to clarify, I'm not trying to, to degrade surf fishermen or anything like that. I'm just, it, it's obviously part of being an angler and being a well-rounded angler is being a surf fisherman. So, I just was curious if uh, if you spend more time on the beach because you have to or because you want to, <laughs> kind of a, you know that that kind of an angle. How about you, Mike Stevens? Yeah, for, uh, for me, it's always been, you know, I grew up in San Diego. Uh, it's always there. It's year round. You know, it doesn't require a, a big investment. A lot of time, if you fish freshwater, you you have the gear that you can, you know, get the job done. You know, obviously, when you get into more specialized type stuff like these guys and Ben, Mm -hmm. you know, it calls for more specialized gear. But just the um, the accessibility is always there. You know, it's something you can always go out and do without having to do a lot of planning. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you can keep enough stuff in your back seat to, you know, I mean, we've we've fished at lunch from from the office here, you know, before it's that type of deal. And. For that, it'll always be part of uh, of my fishing playbook, uh, surf fishing. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so speaking of some of the special, um, some special targeting techniques and everything that you talked about in this book, uh, first of all, you're based out of LA County, but you're also targeting from shore white sea bass, rockfish, and sea uh, and sheephead. Tell me, tell me about this particular set of skills that you bring to uh, fishing from shore. Before we before we jump into that, I just wanted to let Mike know that Gary and I we actually both went to UC San Diego, so but oh, we, cool. didn't fish, we didn't fish there. Yeah, we, uh, it's we weird, studied. man. It, we just we studied. We were both mechanical engineering majors, and we just I guess we studied way too much, and you know didn't uh, didn't have other passions. Well, let's uh, let's get into this question. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we started fishing for perch, like most people do uh, while surf fishing. You know, light line. And then we just kept exploring and exploring, and we started like catching calico bass here and there on sand crabs. And we're, like, yeah, on sand crabs. On sand crabs, and we're like, okay, what oh, if we wow. try to target? Try, what if we try to target these fish? And, and what is it about where we're fishing that's producing calico bass and stuff like that? Yeah, and I remember it was like when we started five years ago. A rod was not like we're using these heavy duty rods for, for surf perch. Yeah, we're using the wrong gear, but slowly we we kind of re- yeah, we, refined our we approach. Refined their techniques. Figured out how to catch some calico bass, and then from then we started catching a little bit of sheephead. Yeah, like, then we started catching some sheephead. How do we target these? Yeah, and uh, and from there was uh, halibut and uh, white sea bass. Last year, uh, I really got into halibut and white sea bass. White sea bass in particular to try to find the best spots. 
I was driving sometimes to San Diego or sometimes to Gaviota in Santa Barbara to try to find spots that had the right look and stuff like that. So it's been a uh, very uh, interesting and, and I would say challenging to to try to understand these species. Uh, yeah, I would say the yeah, like the way that it started like on sand crabs and then uh, we 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 became more explorers than fishermen almost. You know, at we, a certain at a certain point we were ex- we we're going to different spots at different tides and we were really locating where the fish were. Um, before we really had our techniques nailed down, and then one, and then we we, we found the we're spot. Still, we're still improving we're our still, techniques. Yeah. Always optimizing. Always, all, always optimizing. But uh, at a certain point, we we locked down some certain spots, and then we 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 really we really nailed down uh, the right setups for catching these fish. That's equally as important, as which is spots. definitely very important. Because yeah. like one of our sheephead spots, we used to fish it all the time and not catch any sheephead. But once we kind of figured out what we need to use to not break off and stuff like that, it started, mm-hmm. they started becoming more regular for us. So let's jump into that specifically right now. Sheephead. I, what did you, what was the code that you cracked? I mean, not to spoil the book, but yeah, yeah, I mean, everybody's at the edge of their seat. <laughs> uh, I, I say I catch more, I catch more sheephead. Casper is the real sheephead guy. Yeah. I, I catch him too, but I, I've been more into white sea bass and halibut the last year. You want to talk about that? Yeah. Uh, so, there's definitely a physical component to sheephead fishing. You're fishing that really rugged structure, and these fish are bombing into the reef. So you need pretty thick line. Uh, you need uh, decently uh, decently stiff rod. You need a you need a, you need a pretty pretty powerful reel too. And then you need bait that's not going to you know. And then yeah, fly you, off you bait, bait's not going to fly off. So you got to get that bait thread going on. You need a sinker that even when the, you know whatever the waves are, the bait is gonna is gonna sit still. And you don't want to cast, uh, and you you want to cast far enough to where sheep head, sheep head typically are. They can be close, but they tend to be, you know, uh, at least. We're not talking two hundred yards. Or not two hundred yards, but they tend to be at least sixty yards. Fifty out. yards. Yeah, forty something, yards. Yeah, sixty. Yeah, something, something like that. that. A little further is even better. So, How would you describe that in terms of the the shore break? Would they be just past the uh, just past the waves or within them? It doesn't even it, matter. That's actually not that important. Um, they can be where the waves are breaking. Uh, it, it, it doesn't seem to be too big of a factor as long as there's a decent enough depth for the fish to hang out. Yeah, so, so you, you can want, catch them in like, you know, big waves, four foot waves and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, you can catch them in five foot waves, kind of five foot waves, you know. Um, it, ju- it just... There needs to be a certain amount of depth in the water. A certain amount of depth and typically... And the right structure for it. And definitely you need that heavy structure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Is, ben, have you caught a sheephead from shore? I haven't actually, so I'm really interested in this and, <laughs> and I'm sure there's some really particular things. Um, yeah. I yeah. noticed in the book as well, guys, that you had, uh, you had a couple of pictures of some really interesting baits, particularly, um, like small shrimp kind of prawn baits. So maybe, maybe you can just talk about that. What baits do you think? Um, now, for example, if, if, uh, if someone listening to this wanted to go and catch a sheephead this weekend, what, what's going to be their kind of like two or three must take baits and you know, how are you going to rig those? How are you going to fish it? Um, Big baits, small baits, that kind of thing. So that's something I'm really interested in, guys. I would say, in my opinion, that bait is important, but it's it's not that important. Don't use sardines, I would say, to catch sheephead. You're not going to catch uh, sheephead on sardines and anchovies and grunge and stuff like that. But other kinds of baits, you know, like like you mentioned, the uh, uh, prawn mussels, you know, that, you can just look at what sheephead feed on it and, and they'll take any of that yeah, stuff. Yeah, shrimp's good too. Uh, yeah, just... Um... Just I like to put big baits on, uh, simply because a lot of the time, by big I mean maybe uh, co- covering uh, the whole three odd hook or something like that. Um, I like to put big baits on because you'll have small fish nibbling on on the bait a lot of the time, and uh, and you you want to wait for the big you want to wait for the big one, so you want a good amount of bait. I mean, even if you lose a little bit, you still want it to look uh, you still want it to look substantial. So I yeah I, I like to cover the whole hook um, and just wait for the big one to come in and with that bait thread you know they can you have a few bites and then uh, yeah. once the big bite comes in you set the hook how so how do you besides I mean besides the size of your actual bait itself how do you weed out the species that you're not necessarily targeting versus uh, versus the ones that you are you still catch some you catch you catch like little sometimes you, you catch rockfish uh, kelp fish yeah, yeah rock, i don't have a problem with rockfish uh, once in a while an opali yeah the hook the hooks are the hooks are big enough are generally that. too big I, I i mean you do catch the occasional rubber lip perch on them i know those guys are biting all the time they just don't get hooked most of the time uh, so you do you get the occasional opali as well and 
And of course, some calico bass. Yeah, calico bass is. Though it's a slightly yeah. different habitat. Yeah, for calico slightly bass different habitat, head. but you can definitely catch them yeah. while you're going sheephead fishing. So you don't really weed out this. I mean, with the hook size, you kind of do, uh, but you still still catch some of the other fish. Fair amount of bycatch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think one thing that really stands out in your book is there's clearly some, you guys have caught some really big calico bass from the, from the shore, you know, fish that if you caught them on a sport boat, you'd be really proud of. So um, is there some difference maybe in the way you target the calicos and the bass as opposed to the sheephead? And yes, so on? absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so 2020 was a really good year for calico bass for us. And we really got into calico bass before sheephead. Yeah. Before we could cast far, you don't really need to cast that far to catch calico bass. Uh, I think the average angler can can easily get into calico bass territory. It, it, they even come right into the right into the surf zone, you know, where you you catch perch and stuff like that. As long as you have a little bit of reef, you don't need a ton of reef. You know, sheephead maybe is a little bit more rugged structure, but the baits, um, yeah, we do have a specialty bait listed in the book that's produced all my twenty three and twenty four inch calico bass from this. That's only three. It's not that much, but it's caught most of our. Um, 20 plus inch calicos. I don't know. Do you want, do we want to spoil no, that? Bait let, on here? Let's just call it the hidden, the hidden candy bait for calico. <laughs> bass. Uh, there is definitely is one. Uh, we've caught 20 plus inch calicos on other baits, but yeah, all, the 20, all of the 23, 24 inch ones have been produced with this one particular type of bait. So yeah, so, I, don't know, I guess we're going to keep it. We're going to keep it a secret. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure. you're, you're holding your clo- your cards close to your vest on this one yeah, yeah. Uh, or in the book shall we say that's right um okay so let's talk about we talked about calico we've talked about sheephead you guys have some pretty impressive fish that you've caught in this book tell us about your most uh, memorable fish between the two of you guys and then we'll open it to uh to ben and mike here go ahead Gary. I think it's between two fish. It's either the 25-inch sheephead or the 33-inch white sea bass. Yeah, I'll take the 25-inch sheephead, which I caught. And then you take... Is it okay if we share two stories? Yeah, sure. Hey, I'm not holding you back. Yeah, yours is the 33-inch white I, sea I think, bass. I think, yeah, they're both better than the than my 30-inch halibut, I would say. Yeah. Uh, go for the sheephead first. Uh, sheephead... That would happen first. Yeah, I hadn't really yet... This is probably a couple of years ago, huh? Yeah. I hadn't really yet fully optimized... Uh, the rig and my casting technique wasn't that great either, um, but and the tip of my rod was broken, so I was using like a nine and a half, ten foot rod effectively. Now I use longer, and uh, yeah, I, I cast, and then my rod just—I was on rod holder actually. The rod got completely slammed. I cast as far as I could, which which is not as far as I can cast now. Rod got slammed, and then the rod holder almost completely fell to the ground just based off the initial uh, the initial hit. And it was a pretty sturdy rod holder, so luckily I was actually right next to it, or that rod slash reel would have eaten the sand. And then I, I knew immediately that it was a very large fish. It, it went into sheephead means that you're probably fishing really heavy reef, and that day we were. It went into the reef and got stuck a few they times. They bob into the reef as a survival instinct. Yeah. Try and to and get and away. So you have to kind of brute force them out. Yeah, and, just feel, and it feels like your line gets stuck. So there's different techniques you can do to get it unstuck. I tried a few different things like loosening the line and whatnot, waiting for the fish to come out, and then did that a few times, and then eventually brought it in. And uh, it was much bigger than I, I knew it was big, but it was much bigger than I thought it was going to be because up until that point, I don't even think I'd caught it. Maybe I'd caught one twenty inch sheephead or yeah. something. So the twenty five incher was uh, an anomaly. It was an anomaly, and it was like, oh well, yeah, so we, what could, was possible? I do feel I have hooked up on others that are that big, though. I just haven't, uh, you know, for you one reason the they haven't haven't sealed the deal for one reason or another, though. So yeah, that was a twenty five inch sheephead. It really. And so let's hear about this white sea bass. Yeah, so this uh, 33 inch white sea bass. Um, so s- sea bass in the surf zone, they come in bunches. They come in bunches typically, sea bass in the surf zone. So um, we were there early morning, relatively pretty low light, low light conditions, I would say, uh, right around sunrise or so, something like that. And uh, uh, I. I had a few bites and then I caught a really small white sea bass. So I'm like, okay, if there's, were we thinking about leaving? We were actually thinking about leaving at first because we didn't have any bites for the first 10, 15 minutes. So like, let's yeah. go to another sea bass spot. I was fishing with lures. Uh, for sea bass, we typically use lures. Um, 
Well, it's tar- targeting an area that actually has sheep head too, which is really funny. It's really close to the sheep. It's, it's, really it's not the same really area where we caught the big sheep head. It's not, you don't fish the exact same spot for sheep head and white right. sea bass. Right. And what what yeah. general area are we talking about? Uh, this was in uh, Malibu. Yeah, so Malibu. a place, one of our spots in Malibu. We'll, we'll okay, got it. it. And you're using a lure for this white sea bass. Yeah, what, yeah uh, I'm using what, a, a, lure, a, a half ounce uh, weedless. Uh, a swim bait head with like a four, yeah, it was a four inch swim bait actually, not even that big, just a little, little thin four inch swim bait. Okay. And, uh, While I'm that. on the subject, what what color do you remember? Oh, the color. I, I I've caught them on all kinds of colors. I don't think I personally don't think the color matters that much. But the the head. Don't you get that question a lot on this? Yeah, <laughs> like the head was a mixture. I like I sharpied in the head with like black or something, but half of it the color had faded away. The body. Might have been white. Might have been white. Okay. All right. So sorry to interrupt. Okay. So you're you're in Malibu. You're throwing a four inch swim bait, and yeah. now pick it up from there. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I caught a, a, a small white sea bass. And, I got a huge bite. And a Casper. You. Yeah. He, I was actually fishing maybe like 10, 15 yards down from him, or twenty yards or something. And he had, he had a huge bite, and he actually hooked it briefly. Casper's rod was just going up and down like this fish had like serious head shakes. Yeah, I you know? suck at bringing in white sea bass. I always lose them. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but. Uh, Gary's has a better, uh, better getting. His I don't know. Yeah, you, you definitely caught some more after that, but that was yeah. Casper was pretty new. I was really dedicated to sea bass fishing at that point. But anyway, I saw that he had that big fish. And I'm like, yeah, that looks like a sea bass. I'm going to go over to exactly where he is, start casting. I caught a small one. He had another bite that he didn't catch, and then I hooked up onto this onto the 33 inch sea bass, which I knew was big immediately. We like we pretty much knew it was a thirty plus inch sea bass. We knew it was like, a sea wait, bass, wait, wait, basically. Yeah, it, within like, like fifteen seconds. Because of the way it was fighting, what what they do in the surf at least is, is as soon as you hook up on something, they go onto this. They go on these really really long runs, and the the place I was fishing, I was actually only only using twenty pound braid at the time, and with all the reef around, as the sea bass was going on its run, my line was scraping on this reef, and I thought there was a really good chance I would lose it, but thankfully I was able to walk around the rocks a little bit, position myself in a more advantageous uh, place, and uh, over the next five minutes, slowly slowly wear that sea bass out to, to bring it in. So that was an exhilarating catch. That was really fun. Yeah, I almost lost the sea bass at the end. Yeah, he was trying to help me land it. I was it. trying to get in the surf and, and you know, get the fish, but then my my, peak, <laughs> my legs got wrapped around the line. Yeah. Or something. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we got a little excited there. <laughs> Yeah, needless to say, uh, when we brought the fish in, we were super stoked, high fiving each other, and there were a few locals that saw it, and they were like, "This is your lucky day." And we're like, "Yeah." yeah. And then I caught another small, really small one after that that day, and that was it for the day. But it was obviously an epic, one of our most awesome, enjoyable experiences on in the surf. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, that's exciting. But how about you, Ben? Let's talk about some memorable. What's your most memorable catch off the beach? Off yeah, the, off the surf. Yeah. Oh goodness. Um. I think probably the, the most interesting one I've seen uh, was an accidental giant black sea bass. A couple of those last season. That was definitely, um, obviously, put them back very quickly. Mm-hmm. But seeing those, um, and particularly when it's like a 100-pound fish and it's still got spots on it, so it's still juvenile, oh, wow. you really kind of concentrate your mind on what exactly is swimming out there. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, just just some cool fish. I've, you know, I love seeing fish, people catching like Corbina and kind of definitely spot fin croaker are a personal favorite of mine. I think they're fascinating, strange, hard to understand fish, which makes them interesting. So just things like that, but I'm um, really top of my list or one of my top tops of my list is definitely a white sea bass for the next year. Mm-hmm. So this is very interesting. And I've got a question actually for the guys um, in your book, you talked about particular moon cycles you're finding or stages of the moon where you find you catch more white sea bass. So, um, you know, maybe someone like myself who hasn't really caught one particularly off the surf, what sort of things should I be looking out for? What sort of state of moon and tide, um, things like that, should I look out for in order to catch my white sea bass? Yeah. Uh, Take so, it away, Gary. So this white sea bass, the 33-incher, was caught at a higher tide than I typically catch them at. Um, typically, I'm looking for the kind of tide that will produce a sort of dramatic architecture that that a sea bass likes i don't know should i go into more detail on this casper yeah, just give us, yeah. yeah like uh, so depending on your zone you want there to be a relatively significant drop off where it just kind of just gets deep in, in a sort of dramatic way at least i have for for the for most of the sea bass that i've caught and uh sometimes low tide is good for that usually it is maybe a zero foot tide maybe depending on the zone it could even be a two or three foot tide 
So, yeah, you want your lure to be in that drop off. You want your lure to be, in, yeah, yeah, and and not necessarily a very far cast. It doesn't. Have, I can't even. I'm not even that great at casting about it. Yeah, they're just roaming. Yeah. So yeah, I guess you're saying that the tide, and it's also depends on. Depends on the spot. The, the, the tide right? depends on the, yeah, the on spot. spot for, yeah. And then you have to kind of go at a certain time sometimes. and there, it, It's a confluence of a few different factors, typically. But, the, but yeah, I, I hope, hopefully I answered that uh, question about the tide. Uh, I'm trying to wrap my head around it. So it's, essentially it was, it was three to four feet, or, and you're supposed to be aiming for... So like there's reef, and then there's like a big drop off in the reef. It just can't... It, by, by a big drop, let's quantify it. Like, like, eight, like four or five feet yeah, deep. All of a sudden, like maybe you're walking at the edge of reef, and then it all of a sudden gets four to, five feet deep. To go more detail into it, that is typical. That drop off right there is where the white sea bass will pin the bait, and that's why you find them hugging hugging that drop off. You guys have mentioned um, <clears throat> earlier being explorers. At what level does that go to? I mean, are you guys getting on Google Earth, you know, and scroll, yeah. scrolling the whole coast and taking it from there, and then going on foot? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, absolutely. Exactly what we're 100%. doing. One hundred percent. I feel like we have checked out so many reefs and so so much structure from Santa Barbara to San Diego. I I think we know almost every inch of Malibu. Like yeah, it, we know we know every inch of Malibu for sure. It, it's 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 to the point where it's like almost a problem how nerdy we are about Google, about Google Earth. Like we'll we'll see like the, the way reef cascades on Google Earth, and we're like, oh, that looks like a sea bass spot or something like that. <laughs> like we have to, we have to go and check that out. Yeah, yeah, and you know what? In the in the book, you guys have some pretty incredible visuals for this type of thing. Uh, especially you you directly have screen grabs from uh, Google Earth. Uh, Tell me about the uh, the zone of interest, as you guys call it. Uh, it it's throughout the entire book, and I think yeah. it, it illustrates so clearly where you should be casting and where you should be focusing your time. Tell everybody about that. Let me make a quick comment. He never called it zone of interest in real life. It's only when I started, <laughs> I started reading the book. It's zone of interest. I don't know. I started calling zone it zone of that. interest. <laughs> Maybe I should call it area of operation or something. Um, <laughs> yeah, sounds uh, sounds technical. Yeah. No, it, it's basically, uh, depending on, e on which species you're targeting, you're looking for a slightly different looking structure on Google Earth. And the whole point of those images in the book is not to oh, reveal spots because there, there are a lot of spots for actually these kinds of fish, but it's to try to get the reader to understand um, what to look for when they're looking for their own spots in their lo local waters. And, and it, it always, as the book says pretty early on, it always involves some reef. Uh, for what we're doing, it, while, you know, just sand is great for perch and corvinas and stuff, but for uh, you know these kinds of fish, there has to be a little bit of reef, and you can see that in Google Earth. The, the the parts that are really dark signify reef in the water, while the lighter, bluer parts signify sand. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So for this particular, when you're targeting calico or uh, white sea bass, you're not necessarily walking a beach that has no structure and it's just straight sand, correct? Yeah. Yeah, you might be walking sand, but you're casting into some structure. Into structure, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and sometimes you're walking, depending on the tide, you're walking on... Sometimes you're walking on reef. Sometimes you're walking on reef. But never for sheephead fishing, really. Not, not usually, yeah. Very rarely. Because mm -hmm. you can just bomb the cast out really far to reef. But with lures, if you're using, you know, half-ounce lures, you sometimes you need to kind of get in there a little bit. When you approach a... I'm going to keep calling it a zone of interest because yeah. I think it's kind of <laughs> yeah. funny. Uh, when you approach a zone of interest, are you making more targeted casts, or are you fanning out your casts from your from the point that you, in which you're standing? I would say more targeted casts, especially with lure fishing. Especially with lures, it's more targeted casts. But with bait fishing, the area that you can cast into is usually quite large. It's quite large. It's usually as long as the large. reef is large. large. So I just, yeah, if, which we we really only target large. Fairly large reefs. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's never like, oh, man, it's just it went for bait fishing. Oh, man, there's just one hole that's 100 yards out, and I got to get it right. It's not like that. It's not like that for bait fishing. But for lures, it's... it's Sometimes, more, yeah, you might see like it's this, more this really deep pocket that you just want to keep casting into over and over for like 10, 15 minutes, and then if you're not getting a bite, you move on. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a battle. I mean, whether you're fishing largemouth bass in a lake or if you're fishing pretty much anywhere, I think you you kind of fight in your own head. Do I do I cast to that same spot again? It seems so fishy. Or do I fan my cast out and maybe approach it from a different angle? And, you know, of course, you, if you have the time, you could do both. But if not, 
you're just trying to power uh, power fish that area. Ben, Ben, what do you think about that targeted cast versus the fanned cast? I suppose it depends, really. I think the difference, <clears throat> the the factor in my mind is if you're fishing bait and weight or um, or lure fishing. Mm-hmm. Well, definitely, if I'm lure fishing, I'm fanning that cast. I'm working each bit of structure, each area, probably multiple times. Bait and weight fishing, I think, is more about um, getting the centro laid down into the, into the flow or the current. And uh, really, hopefully, waiting for the the fish, which is really the essence of bait and weight fishing, to find your bait via your lovely fresh scent trail or, or whatever you whatever you're kicking out as a as an attractant. So, um, but yeah, but also you know, if the, I think definitely one thing I'm learning listening to these guys and reading their book is that obviously these sheephead are living in very particular areas, and I imagine they probably have like maybe they're a bit territorial, maybe they've got little holes. I don't know, maybe. Maybe you guys might have some thoughts about that, but definitely like sticking a bait in front of that little hole seems to me to be possibly quite a critical thing, but definitely for the rockfish. I mean, we've all seen the concentrations of rockfish, how they love just sitting right in those rocks. And if you're not fishing right in that zone, you're not going to get bit. So there's probably a, probably an element of both. And definitely reading that book has, you know, it's kind of inspired me to, to go and target some of these rockier places full of fish. So I don't know guys, what do you think? What, are, are the sheephead kind of, and the rockfish, are they very, very territorial? Are they, likely to kind of come out and have a bit of a roam around when they're feeding or are they just going to sit in their hole and wait for something to land in front of their face? You know, I don't, if I put (laughs) hypothetical, if I take home 20 sheephead from a spot and I come the next day, it's not going to be empty. There are going to be other sheephead that are in there. And it's a pretty big range. As long as you're fishing an extensive reef, we're not with bait and weight, as you said, we're not trying to get it into a very, as we're trying to get it somewhere in that big structure in that, where, dense reef, that yeah. we've determined that the fish are. Yeah. The fish yeah. Live. And, but with lure fishing, it's more specific. I know like for the 30 inch wide sea bass we caught, we were fishing this very specific deep drop and we were there for like 20 minutes, not getting a bite. But we're just casting in the same spot over and over. And then finally, you know, one of them takes it. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know how territorial they are. I, I think only one time I've caught the same rock fish twice. I've caught the same calico twice, once, two weeks apart. And I knew, knew, knew it was the same one because the first one broke me off and it was, yeah, that's how I knew the rock fish fishing line. It was, it was our <laughs> fishing have, line. Have and I, have I, have I, it's about that's how I knew the rock fish was I've never caught the same sheep had twice to my knowledge. Um, but my feeling is, uh, as long as the food supply is there in these reefs, uh, fish are going to come in and they're going to snack. And I, 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 I don't think uh, it's sh- not as you don't have to be as particular as as probably most people think. At least in our experience, yeah. About, about where to yeah. cast. I, I don't head. think there's like you know a certain population of them that are just Maybe. there their whole lives. I, I, I don't yeah. In Malibu, so. we've caught them at like ten different reefs it's not like they're in just one place i want i want people to know that it's not like you have to find the spot for sheephead yeah if you i i believe if you look at the methodology in the book for like identifying reefs on google earth you'll find them in in a a fair amount of different places yeah for sure Hmm. okay uh so let's talk about a different species here. Uh, so rockfish season is closed to boat based anglers. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people would be interested in learning how to target rockfish from the shore. Can you talk a little bit about that? Do you guys have experience with, uh, with targeting rockfish from the beach? So rockfish, calico bass, sheephead and, and uh, sheephead and cabazon all fall under the umbrella of bait and weight fishing forests. So there's significant overlap. Like if you're fishing, Exactly how you fish for sheephead, you're also going to catch rockfish. And cabazon. And, co- and, ca- and, and calico. And calico. But uh, in terms of specifically targeting rockfish, we're either targeting calico bass or sheephead, right? Yeah. Bro? yeah. But we catch rockfish too yeah, as part of yeah. it. We never go out like, oh, man, I, re- I got this really good rockfish spot. No, it's I got this reef. And because it's a reef, it produces all four of these fish. And... Uh, yeah, and, and, you kind of spin yeah. the wheel and see what you get. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah, and then yeah, exactly. I should have said spin the reel. <laughs> I just I missed a good <laughs> opportunity. Spin the reel. <laughs> uh, speaking of spinning the reel, what types of uh, of reels are you guys using? Rod rod and reel combos. So, yeah, I, this is this is one thing that I'm I'm we're constantly trying to optimize. I'm trying to upgrade. Like I've been using for I was using for. Uh, I was using actually my dad's rod for, for lures, which is like an eight foot six, eight to 17 pound weighted surf rod. That's like 70 bucks, nothing crazy. can't cast super far, but that's what I've been using recently. 
I've just tried to step up my game to uh, to, to get something a little bit more high end. For bay and weight, I was using a BG five thousand. I, I still use a BG five thousand. I but... use a spin spinfisher thirty five hundred for a uh, cast and retrieve for yeah. Steve Bass and how Yeah, and the BG. I'm I'm trying to look into other reels that are. Uh... A little more intended for our application, I believe. The like BG... East Coast, we're looking to like East Coast fishing because they do a lot more long cast bait and weight there. And we're trying to figure out how we yeah. can optimize what we're doing to try to catch maybe even bigger, deeper sheephead. So yeah, so that's 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 where the optimization is at this point. But most of the fish have been most of the bait and weight fish have been caught on a BG five thousand. Yeah, Daiwa. Hmm. Yeah, and then and then line selection. How important is line selection for you guys? Very. Line selection is very, very important. More than the brand, the the, the pound test, the, the test. Uh, Not only the pound test, but the abrasion resistance. The abrasion resistance. The abrasion right. resistance is really important. The line for bait and weight. If you're fishing these thick reefs, because it's going to be it's going to be scraping up on reef. You need some thick braid. Yeah, uh, braid. The th- most of the abrasion resistance comes from we typically use fluorocarbon. Oh, for, fluorocarbon the leader, for the leader. leader for the yeah, leader. Yeah. yeah, and then the thicker the braid, obviously, you know. Uh, the less likely it is to get caught on a sharp reef. Having said that, there are some reefs, doesn't matter how thick your braid is, if, if you get caught at the wrong angle at the wrong time, it's going to get cut. Um, so you want you want pretty thick, uh, you want at least, you know, 40 pound uh, liter. And, um, and like 60, 60 main pound braid. Yeah, something. yeah, that matching braid with it. A little lighter for lure fishing, but still like 20, 20, yeah. 30 pound 40, 40, in my opinion, seems pretty heavy am i am i wrong in that we might be desensitized we've been doing this for a couple of years we, yeah yeah uh i don't know yeah what do you think about that ben is would would you throw 40 a 40 pound liter on yeah well i mean having having really read through your book which is really very good by the way so congratulations guys it's a great piece of work Thanks, um, thank you i can see why you do 65 i think you mentioned the 60 65 in the book as well yeah, um, yeah. i'm gonna see why because if you're fishing right tight against those rocks and something like a big sheep head hits that's a, they've got a surprising amount of force um, on the take, first of all. And also, I imagine, and this is going to be a question, actually, which I was going to ask after you finish talking about this, but I'll drop it in now, is um, obviously when you're fishing against rocks, you're going to want to get most of your tackle back, aren't you? You're not going to want to just get busted off from, you know, when, when it touches the first bit of rock. No, um, so I was wondering, do you have any tips for people, you know, if you're fishing near kelp or near rocks, um, it's inevitable you're going to lose a bit of tackle, but what do you guys need to minimize your losses? Yeah, I mean, nowadays, I, I'll fish for three or four hours and maybe lose one rig, something like that. And in, in like structure that one liter, uh, one yeah, one liter, one liter, uh, like on average, you know, some days I'll lose three or four and that would be a bad day. But when we first started, we were, we were losing a, a lot of liters. There's a I huge, we didn't, you know, yeah, it's not but, great for the ecosystem. But, but, but there's definitely like when you use heavier line, you, you lose a lot less than you think you're going to lose in this structure. There's a huge, uh, physical component you got to bring that you got to bring that bait in as fast as you can i've seen some yeah while retrieving, while retrieving you got to retrieve fast so that however fast you think i'm retrieving i'm probably retrieving faster than that like just so you're, you're just so you, you don't, don't get snag, snag on, the reef, snag on the reef on the way back that's really important um you got to keep the pressure on the fish like a lot of pressure on the fish uh so <laughs> so it doesn't dive into that reef it's it's, it's very it's a very physical very physical yeah kind of thing. unlike the bait, the bait and weight fishing. unlike lure fishing for halibut and white sea bass you let the fish run uh you you loosen your drag you let them run but if you're reef fishing for calicos and sheephead what they do is they dive down downward into the reef and if you let them run you're gonna lose you're gonna lose the fish you're gonna lose tackle so you gotta get that drag buttoned down real tight and that's part of the reason why we also use uh, you know heavy line and stuff yeah okay so let's let's go to another species here, which you you touch on on the book a little bit. Grunion. What is your perspective of the grunion run? Uh, I know because I read it in the book, but share with me. You hear about the grunion run? What do you do? Do you rush out there or the next morning? Where, where do you guys stand on the grunion run and shore fishing? We like grunion runs. Uh, love them. Love, love grunion runs. Grunion runs. They bring big fish into shore. Dude, I don't know if we, I don't know if we caught, kept any grunion last year. No, we didn't. The year before, man. Uh, but so, um, yeah, we don't fish the night of that much. So what's what's going on in grunion runs is the night of the grunion runs, you have these really high, high tides, you know, like five foot high tides or something. So what that what corresponds to is the next morning you have these really low tides, minus tides, which expose structure and you can go out there and 
maybe catch a trophy halibut or trophy white sea bass. So we fish in the mornings after of the grunny of the grunny runs. You know, grunny runs are for like three or four days, and and those mornings have had really uh, favorable tides for for lure fishing. For lure fishing. For yeah. lure fishing. So that's uh, so we love grunny. In short. <laughs> Yeah, Ben, have you ex- experienced a grunion run? <laughs> I have actually. I've, I've been on a few, and I've luckily found them a few times. Yeah, and um, I found some quite strange things about fishing with the grunion run because, <clears throat> excuse me, because on paper you think this is going to be brilliant because there's just this stack of bait fish coming up the beach. Uh, in reality, I found it's quite odd because I think what happens is you seem to have a very very slow period until the grunions start running, and it seems to be everything's holding offshore or possibly waiting to have their feeding spell until those grunion really arrive. And when the grunion arrive, you think it's going to be full of sharks and all, all sorts of teethy stuff. And in my experience, I've caught a lot of big bat rays when the grunion run, but very little else until yeah. the next day where, as you said, often the remnants of the grunion run um, produces a kind of added interest from things like halibut, which tend to come in, come in a little bit closer, maybe mopping up those, those eggs and all those kind of lovely, uh, lovely scent trails. But also I found uh, fishing the few days before the grunion run. Because I think one of the things about the Grunion Run is, as you guys pointed out, that the high tide is often kind of in that 10, 11 o'clock period. And in my mind, if I'm fishing for something off the beach that um, maybe bait and weight, which I probably would be at night, really, I'm relying on a scent trail and I want water moving in order to carry that scent trail out. And if it's high tide at 10 or 11, that water isn't going to start really pumping out until midnight-ish. And I've seen this quite a lot of times and sitting there, nothing happens until that water really starts moving out and that's when it happens. Mm. But the problem is that that's like midnight, <laughs> one, two, three in the morning. So it's not really a very social time to go fishing. Yeah. On often a lot of beaches closed then. So um, okay. I found fishing actually on that period. It's better two, three, four days beforehand when that critical period of the water and that really would, starts uh, to move out. And be for sharks, Ben? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, mostly for sharks at uh, night. The, yeah, when the tide starts going up. We're having a hard time hearing you. It's you're okay. talking about targeting sharks at night. Yeah, because yeah. uh, Ben's talking about when the tide starts going out at midnight. Uh, I, I'm just asking if he's targeting sharks at uh, when, when, when he's when, when he's fishing at that time. Yeah. Oh, are, are you targeting sharks at night? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. This is the context is very much uh, bait and wait for something larger, but but also I've noticed that it really is very quiet and that kind of period right before the grunion run, you think it's all about to kick off, and yeah, almost, I've had it quite a few times when you could really you look down and you see the grunion in the in the you know flopping around and within within a matter of minutes you get a take and it's always a big, always a big bat ray <laughs> <laughs> always a big bat i agree with you a few days before the grunion run it does really well too ben yeah a few days before the grunion run yeah. oh that's interesting the run too, and, and sometimes a few days before yeah why do you think it'd be happening before? Well, I think Just out of curiosity. On, I think what's going on is, is the bigger fish, uh, like in our case, halibut and, and white sea bass, know that the grunion run is, is going to happen, or maybe even grunion are sort of getting ready to stage already. So uh, there's heightened activity even a few days, heightened activity even a few days before the run. Ah, a little uh, a little sneak peek at the, at what's to come. <laughs> how about you, Mike Stevens? How do you feel about the grunion? I'm sure you got a good grunion run story. I've, I've actually I fished a, during a grunion run one night. Like Ben said, it just seems like at the time I was probably 21, 22, but it seemed like something you know you pick up a bait, pin it on, and I mean I fished it like on a sliding egg sinker, like I was on a half day boat. And I threw it out there, and I did hook something I could not turn around. And now I realize it was probably a bat, <laughs> probably a bat, right? You know, I never <laughs> saw what it was. But uh, yeah, that's really my. That's what I'm we gonna... do. We try fishing at night during gunning runs too. It's a yeah, sliding half ounce egg sinker with a live gun. And we haven't caught that much either. We've caught a few small, some rays, you know, some calicos, <laughs> some ca- a few small calicos, a few small halibut, but nothing too big that during fish, the actual runs. runs you know. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, you know, I think this kind of wraps up the uh, the conversation here today. Uh, tell us, tell the audience how they can read this book. Yeah, you can go to our uh, website, which we just put up for the book, um, www.californiasurffishing.net. So I'll repeat that, californiasurffishing.net, just in case our sound isn't that good right now. And uh, you can buy the book there. We also have some freebies there for people to check out. Um we're on Instagram at California Surf Fishing. If you just want to see whatever we catch, whenever we catch something that we think is pretty cool, we put it up on our Instagram. So, yeah, that's yeah, about it. Uh, yeah. I uh, just wanted to thank you guys. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Brad, Ben, and Mike. You know, uh, yeah, no problem at all. Thanks, guys. Thanks for sharing all that knowledge. You know, it's incredibly useful, insightful stuff. So, you know, thanks for putting that out there. Yeah, and did, I didn't. I closed the floor, but were there any other additional questions for the guys? I got one question actually. So, um, you know, we've got quite a few interesting critters swimming around in Southern California. Is there anything that's on your kind of bucket list? Anything that you're targeting this year that you'd really want to, really want to see? I know you've caught this, but I want to catch that black sea bass, man. But release it, <laughs> yeah. but release it immediately. Really? Accidentally. <laughs> yeah, accidentally, you say. Unless you're in Mexico. Yes. We're going to target black sea bass. If we happen to catch one, then we will release it immediately. <laughs> that would be really cool, though. That would be so cool. What about maybe a, maybe a striped bass or something? That would be cool, too. You know, there are people that actually target striped bass in California. And I don't, in Southern California. In Southern California. Uh, in North Cali, it's well known, yeah. And I don't Sounds like you got to listen to the Western Outdoor News podcast a couple episodes ago. Yeah, I think I will. I think I will. I have yeah, to- we had a guy on talking just about that. That's so cool. I think that's so cool. Um, that's that's one for sure. We have we haven't caught a single striped bass in Southern California with all the fishing that we do. So it's, they're definitely doing something different than we are. Um, and one that I have, I, I probably will never be able to do this, but like to to catch yellowtail with with lures. So. We'll see. <laughs> I have a, a weird conversation starter, and I, I don't know why I'm starting it here at the end of the conversation. <laughs> but uh, since everybody's all gathered here, I have a very important topic to to ask everybody's opinions on. Okay. And people think I'm crazy for this, but I think eyes on lures don't make any sense. I agree. Okay. <laughs> it, yeah. I mean, let me let me plead my case here, and we'll see if you guys agree on this. An eye is a defense mechanism, right? It's supposed to, like a halibut, they, they, I'm sure there's a name for it. They have the fake eye on the tail. They mm-hmm. have, there's all sorts of species with fake eyes everywhere as a defense mechanism against attacks. So why are we putting eyes on jig heads and, on stuff? Jig heads and lures and swim baits and everything? Because it, go, ben, ben is interjecting here. What do you I've think? I've got the answers, Brad. It's to catch the angler, not the fish. <laughs> All you have to do is look at the long-term success of something like a cedar plug. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, I mean, maybe maybe they might make a slight difference if you're working the lure very slowly in fresh water yeah. with a very, very in, in good, clean conditions that it looks exactly like a shad. Yes. But maybe in general, possibly not. Mm-hmm. I think most of them are probably there to catch the angler, not the fish. Yeah. yeah. I, I would agree with that. I, at least in my fishing – the jig head that I, the weedless jig head that I use most of the time doesn't have an eye. And I think it catches more than the ones I've used that do have eyes. So I don't know. Yeah. Catch the angler. I'm totally, totally agree with that. I think. I just wanted you guys to, to affirm my beliefs in this. <laughs> right, I think uh, there's a whole podcast on its own right there. Yeah, I know yeah. because there's, I mean the whole, of course the swim bait industry and those jig heads with the giant eyes that almost take up the entire, uh, you know, head of the, the, the weight. It's, it, it always boggles my mind. S- Stevens, you're being very quiet here. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I've, and we've actually talked about stuff like this on a previous podcast. We were talking about colors and stuff and I'm like, you know, how many different colors of things do you you need and 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 Ben brought up the uh, the example about the cedar plug. Yeah, the cedar plug. And I and in in the other podcast, I brought up you know you see guys who kill it on surface iron on these boats, and the paint's chewed off. Mm-hmm. You know, so as far as colors, I'm, I'm saying colors, but this it falls into Eyes, that because yeah. it's effectively a color mm-hmm. up towards the. Um, I don't think it matters. You know, I think I think <laughs> you see so many examples of stuff that is just made to catch fishermen um yeah i do have lead heads with eyes just because it's what was there but uh mm-hmm. i don't notice a difference <laughs> yeah you know strong take but you're, but you're you're making it sound like it might be worse i you actually know? think it might it might actually be worse i i think if if it's a defense mechanism in nature then it might it might dissuade a fish from biting your lure if he says, "Oh well, I, there's I, he's looking at me. I'm I, yeah. I'm not going to bite that lure." <laughs> that one can see. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good I theory. Let's put a blind fish swimming around. That's also going to be a yeah, big, big easy meal, isn't it? So. it? It might be. So, so I don't uh, know. A little a little added, a little extra something here at the end of the conversation. That, that, that tail action, guys. Yeah, I think it's just about the vibration of, of the lure. That's what I think. Who knows? Hmm. Yeah, the size of the the paddle, the of a swim bait. I'm, yeah. I'm saying, but 
uh, yeah, the, the vibration that it makes that those things make sense. I just, I'd always see that the eyes at the tackle shops and I'm like, why would you want a defense mechanism on your lure that's supposed to entice them to bite? I'm going to start popping out the eyes on live sardines now. Well, <laughs> And that's, that's just the case. That's just what he does in his backyard on his weekends, <laughs> like a serial killer. <laughs> okay. Oh, Sorry. Man. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll oh, stop. Man. But, you know, thank you guys for joining the show. Uh, if you guys have any other hot takes like that, you know, feel free to let us know and we can deliberate. <laughs> <laughs> any hot takes? Okay, let me think one. about that. If I have any hot, let me think about that for 10 just seconds. A few, a few seconds. A few seconds. I don't think I have yeah. anything else personally. <laughs> yeah, I have a hot take. Oh, here we go. For some reason, Lucky Craft halibut fishing has gotten way too popular com- compared to the other types of fishing that you can do in Southern California. That's my hot take. I don't know. Is it that hot? Is it that hot of a take? I don't know. Yeah. Oh, Are you just seeing beaches loaded with people throwing Lucky Crafts? Or what What would cause you to say yeah, this? Yeah, kind of. We see a lot of Lucky Craft fishermen. Yeah, we do. And and it works. It works. It's great. It's great. Fantastic. There are other, there are other things you can do too, huh? Yeah, there are other things you can do. <laughs> all right well do you guys have strong thoughts on lucky craft fishing? <laughs> we have nothing against lucky craft they work it's just you know you don't catch sheep and stuff with them or whatever yeah what do you I, think ben i think i think they clearly work but i think they're a bit of an awkward lure i think first of all lucky craft is um it's very well marketed bass lure but i'm not 100 percent sure about it's really is it really that great a choice for use in the surf they don't seem to cast very far. They, they lip lure, which automatically just catches straight in the wind. I see a lot of people fishing them with like heavy mono and they can't cast it very far. By the time it's actually got below the surface and is working, it's almost by their feet and it's probably picking up maybe the halibut really quite close in. But in my mind, um, in fact, I just recently got my hands on a, um, a Daiwa SP minnow, sinking minnow, and that's a lipless bait. It's a fast sinking crank bait, essentially. And that thing... There's two and a half ounces and that will absolutely fly mm-hmm. and then sink. So I'm kind of looking forward to doing that. I'm going to compare this couple of days, Lucky Craft and the, and the Daiwa SP sinking minnow. Yeah, I agree. But, um, but I think I yeah, go for craft, Lucky Craft for sure. They don't cast that well in the wind. And I'm also dabbling uh, with the Daiwa SP minnow. So we'll see what both of us uh, catch with, with these big lures. Yeah, excellent. I got, a, I got the smelt pattern, which looks very much like a grunion. Yeah. And um, comes with some serious 3.0 saltwater hooks as well which i quite like as opposed to some of the other kind of lucky craft type lures which come with these quite small kind of like bass orientated hooks maybe mm-hmm. so um so i don't know it's kind of interesting to see the comparison but yeah i think the lucky craft one unless you're a really good angler with with a really good setup able to cast that really quite far i don't think it's probably the best lure maybe maybe something like a little cast master or something like a more of the sinking kind of bait might be a better option to use definitely from the flat sandy beaches where the fish are maybe sat on that kind of secondary bar, um, that might be a better option for some people. But like you said, they're very successful. A lot of people catch a lot of fish on them. So um, what do I know? <laughs> what, do, <laughs> no, what do you know? Exactly. Yeah, I'm just I did some good analysis there. I, I tend to agree with most of what you said. This has been Gary and Casper. The book is called California Surf Fishing, The Hunt for Big Fish. You can check the link in the show notes of this episode right on your phone or on your computer. And uh, thanks again for joining the show. And I'm sure we'll hear more and see more photos from your from your trips this year. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much, guys. If you've been enjoying the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes or on Spotify or on YouTube, wherever you're listening. If you can just leave us a review, it helps us out a lot. Next week, we have a really interesting conversation with a Grunion Run expert. If you have any question about Grunion, you can send us a message on Instagram or send us an email at podcast at woenews.com. Any questions about Grunion, we're talking to an expert. So let us know. We'll see you next week. 